has always been highly important, very interesting, and extremely esoteric. And it's esoteric because of necessity, it straddles a number of different disciplines that are very difficult to master and require a high degree of expertise to master. Commercial realities, environmental realities, geopolitical realities, and military realities. The war that began on the 24th of February has unsettled whatever balance there was amongst these different dimensions of things. Not that anyone agreed as to what the correct balance is, but it's different now. But fortunately, we have speakers who have spent a long time addressing different aspects of this problem, so you'll have a good interplay of perspectives as well as views, mm -hmm. and hopefully avoid the vice of many people dealing with the Arctic matters of having commanding expertise in your own area and displaying dazzling blindness about all the others. <laughs> uh, so at that, I will introduce the speakers as I call on them initially uh, for five minute opening statements. Then we will have a, uh, a brief um, exchange here and then hopefully have at least a good half hour for discussion. I'm always reminding people the audience at a Riga conference is not a random collection of people. They are highly expert, experienced people in their own right. Mm -hmm. And you should, be, you should play a full part in these mm -hmm. proceedings. Uh, to my right is Tim Riley, who um, is, um, I forget all his illustrious titles, but he is from the Scott Polar Research Institute of the University of Cambridge. He also has a diploma from M. Guimau, which is the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. And uh, it's interesting military, British military background uh, as well in, in and overlapping with an institution I've been well connected with. But at that, Tim, tell us what uh, you need to tell us. Floor is yours. <laughs> well, thanks for that, James. Um, that's marvelous start. Let's see why it's important. And I've got to romp through this because I've got my man on the left here who's going to jab me with a pointed stick. The Arctic is important for three or four reasons. One, it is at the epicenter of climate change and probably one of the most important regions in the world in the physical change in the, in the, in the atmosphere and the climate and therefore the environment and it is the rate of change which is so important for the scientists amongst you in terms of collecting data so that we can model so it is the most vital area on earth at the moment for collecting data on the changing physical state of the earth the second reason is that it, the strategic as we well know now has not gone gone away there's nuclear capability in there there is the emergence of a new slock the northern sea route and of course there are still hydrocarbon reserves and, and rare earths, which are especially important when we haven't talked about chips and all the rest of it earlier on. So those are the three reasons. The fourth emerging reason is the cis lunar. Arctic is the highest latitude on Earth, and therefore its proximity for low Earth orbiting satellites is, is part of the reason that China's there, certainly why the United States is there, Russia has always been there, and why NATO will have an interest. That link is critical, the thrust of what I was going to say. We heard earlier today about talking about regions of the world. The United States now considers Indo-Pacific, Eurasia, and Arctic the three geopolitical centers of the Earth for the 21st century. Note that the Arctic is obviously part of Eurasia as well. So it is now a very, very important part of the world. Um, and I would say that as a result now of sanctions, there are three uh, effects as far, far as the Russian. There is now absolutely a deepening relationship with China in the region, unfortunately. There is a move now from apparent securitization, search and rescue, and anything that debatably could, could possibly be involved in the military. 
quite a good argument actually, but a move from securitization to militarization. But probably most important is there has been no effect at all on the freedom of movement of Russia in the Arctic. That is really important and something that, um, not an unintended result of the sanctions, but it has not made much effect. If anything, it has deepened that relationship uh, with China for reasons we'll, we'll hear. What are the threats? Let's get to it. Number one, short-term military Russian. Number two, Sino-Russian geoeconomic. Number three, long-term, full-spectrum Chinese, including cis-lunar aspect of it. Those are the immediate threats heading our way. So Russia is rightly the military power. I would be worried, frankly, about the Sino-Russian geoeconomic. And, th and finally, that will spin out of that, will be the cis-lunar aspect, which is about Chinese governance over the region. Um, from a from the Sino-Russian point of view, I was asked, James asked me to talk about this, three things that they're getting that are specifically useful for China in the Arctic. Number one, by working with Russia, they have 70 years of institutional Russian knowledge of space. They have institutional Russian knowledge of STEM and technology and R&D. And they have, number three, institutional knowledge of the Arctic. And Russia is predominant in the Arctic, just geographically alone, but from the point of view of a launch pad for science, um, search and rescue, northern sea route, in, and knowledge of how the, the air operates. So those are three reasons. Um, from the Russian point of view, interlocutor between the EU and China for trade. That's the NSR Hamburg you get for your trade in return for Nord Stream. Didn't quite go well, but you can see the, the thrust of it. Um, so Russia, Putin wants to be an interlocutor. Number two, the, the Greater Eurasian Programme is taking shape there in terms of a regionalization, a look at new world development, how it would go about in a multi-regional, not multipolar. Multipolar would get an immediate, it would be seen as existential threat to the United States and they get slapped. So it's multi-regional approach going on and one of those areas is the Arctic. And of course, Russia would like to benefit from the technology that China's developing, which is the underpinning of the service economy, which is the GDP of the 21st century and what the US-China war is really about. And they see by hanging on with China, giving them STEM, that they may benefit from that in the long term. So the outcomes are, so the strategy is one of geoeconomic, really, not so much military, multi-regionalism, undermining globalization, under, undermining American status as a leader of the world. Um, it is building confidence, building measures, in, because of the problem of trust that people like Bobolo have rightly pointed out, but they're building it through these projects, they actually are confidence building measures of in and of themselves. The outcomes of this, uh, really Belt and Road is a geoeconomic governance tool into the Arctic. The NSR is a platform for technologies into the cis lunar. That's why China is investing so much of it through LNG, Novatech, and all the rest of it. Um, the Arctic Council, my view is if the Russian Federation is thrown out of the Arctic Council, it would be akin to the United States leaving NATO. It is too powerful and it will get into bed with China. And I would say now that we're facing the, no longer the European Arctic, a change in mentality. Number one, it's the Eurasian Arctic. And number two is the link to cis lunar aspect and space aspect. That is the framework in which we're looking at with Sino-Russian to a greater or less extent. If you want to look, uh, the, the Chinese view was from the general, if we control technology over the Arctic, we control two oceans and three continents. It's about governance for China, not necessarily kinetic presence and taking on the United States spatially, technology, culturally, governance-wise. Um, and from that point of view, if I was to ask, what is the weather vane of Chinese support of Russia in Ukraine? Don't look to Ukraine, look to the Novatech project. That is critical, not just for LNG exp exports to the biggest LNG market in the world in Northeast Asia. It is what it says about the point of the Northern Sea Route, sea power developing along that route, platform to space, etc., etc., etc. So, jab, jab. Jab, jab, okay. What do we do? Solutions, a geoeconomic three-dimensional view of, of framework. The TAOR for NATO has to go to the Bering Straits because that's where the Chinese and Russian effort will be. Domain awareness is utterly critical now. 
Um, space governance is where the game is going to be. And my final point really, and, and that we can expand, if you take the AUKUS that you will be familiar with, I would say now for the Arctic, put a C at the front for Canada and put an A at the end for Asia, Japan, South Korea initially. So we get AUKUS becomes Caucasus, and then you get a circumpolar containment of that region, which I think should be very much looked on as an ISR to begin with. It's too big a region to take on. TAOR, Eurasia to Bering Straits, Caucasa starts looking at the northern dimension, helping the United States with Quad and AUKUS. I'd leave it at that. Congratulations. You have, with impressive clarity, just made an extremely complex subject even more complicated. Pavel <laughs> uh, Baev, um, an old friend for 25 years, is a Russian who is also a Russianist, but he's also a Norwegian um, as well. Uh, he is a he is a senior uh, research professor and other things at PRIO, which is the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. And um, he writes about once a week or every fortnight, uh, very, uh, very intriguing and interesting original articles for the Eurasia Defense Monitor of Jamestown Foundation. Some of you have seen it. And he is very interested, of course, in the Arctic as well, and writes a lot about that, and even a bit in China. So in view of what you have heard, but also in view of what uh, the thoughts you arrived with, uh, uh, what, uh, what would you like to contribute to, th to this discussion? Uh, three points, very quickly, in my precious five minutes. One will be about hard winter. Mm. We have heard a lot about hard winter, which is coming for Europe, but I want to emphasize that it's extremely hard winter for Gazprom. It has to shut down a lot of its production facilities on Yamal. LNG from Yamal is still coming to Europe, but the piped gas, that's a different story. There is nowhere to go and uh, no way to use it inside Russia. And shutting down these uh, production facilities essentially means that they're gone for good. You will not be able to shut them back up uh, in spring. Mm. Probably with uh, the best service companies in the world, with Halliburtons and the likes, it might have been possible, but they're not there anymore. And this hard winter for Gazprom is not coming, it has already arrived. That's my first very minor point. My larger point is about militarization of the Arctic, which was always the main track of Russian policy in the Arctic, parallel with the economic development, parallel with the Gazprom's uh, uh, in Yamal. We had a lot of worries about this uh, massive and sustained military buildup Russia had been doing in the Arctic in, in the last decade. Now it's time to reevaluate these worries. And not only because a lot of uh, assets, a lot of capabilities which Russia developed for the Arctic and paraded on the Red Square in the Arctic camouflage are now redeployed to Ukraine and destroyed. So Finland cannot worry anymore about the Arctic Brigade right, right next to Rovaniemi because that brigade is gone for good. There is more than that. I think now we can recognize that this strategic priority Russia set for military build-up in the Arctic was one colossal blunder. It's completely wasted investment. Every military base Russia created along the long Northern Sea route means one battalion tactical group less in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Every nuclear strategic submarine break class constructed and incorporated into the Northern Fleet means 10 battalion tactical groups less in Ukraine. And these berets are sitting idle, doing nothing. You cannot harvest any dividends from these uh, investments. So uh, our worries about this Russian military build-up are, are less, but it's also interesting to, to acknowledge you know, that Russia is really, has really wasted a lot of um, effort doing that, building that position of power, which is completely useless. 
kind of trying to uh, sustain uh, confrontation with NATO, which it now cannot engage in. NATO had big exercises in the, uh, in the Arctic this spring, Trident Junction, biggest ever, and Russia used to interfere with those exercises outrageously. Not this year, no capabilities. Right now, NATO is conducting the strategic deterrence exercises, steadfast noon. What is Russia's response? Pretending they're not happening. You know, that's, that's the situation. Uh, so, in conventional terms, we have much less to worry about in the, in the, uh, in the high north. But there is one new worry, starting with big letter M, which means nuclear. And that's my last and third point. There is a lot of discussion about possibilities of nuclear escalation in Ukraine, about the Russian non-strategic weapons. The plain fact is that these non-strategic warheads were sitting idle in the 12 storages for more <clears> than three <throat> decades. If you take the decision to use them, the first thing to do is to test. The only place you can really test is Nova Zemlya. And that's a, that's a serious worry. That's a, cons uh, a development we all need to watch and be, uh, and be worried about. Uh, certainly, there were many tests in Norway, Zemlya, Khrushchev, Tsaribomba. Uh, in, in the year 56 was a colossal explosion, and planet Earth generally remains suitable for ha uh, habitation. But uh, it will, a test will not amount to crossing nuclear threshold, but will be a very worrisome development, and I think that is something we need to watch. My five minutes. Um, thank you very much. You've said a number of things that I've never heard you say before. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, others will pick you up on them. I don't have time to do that. Because <laughs> for one thing, I must introduce Balkan Devlin, who is senior fellow of the McDonald uh, Laurier Institute in Ottawa. He is, of course, Canadian, but more surprisingly, um, maybe not surprising, he well understands what many overlook, that Canada is a major player in the Arctic, and he has ideas about it. But, uh, Boken, you are also a geopolitician, if I dare use that word, and you think ahead as to how, how geopolitics is evolving uh, in general. So, um, in view of what you've heard, um, what would you contest? What would you, what would you add to this discussion? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's it's going to be a hard uh, act to follow these two uh, excellent uh, presentations. Uh, what I will try to do is try to channel uh, a recent project we did um, with Conrad in our Stiftungs uh, Canada office uh, on the Arctic and how Canada can work with its allies in the Arctic. And I'll touch upon three themes here, I think, um, that we need to think about. Infrastructure, uh, close cooperation with allies, and thinking um, uh, Arctic-Baltic uh, connection, uh, perhaps more, more thoroughly. The first one is on, on, on infrastructure. Um, at least when we particularly think about the Canadian Arctic, um, it's, there is a challenge on, on every level, getting things in, getting things out, transportation, communications, energy. Mm -hmm. Um, that needs to be really solved to be able to operate not only on um, so on the military basis but also in terms of economic development and prosperity so pretty much everything you need to when you think about the infrastructure in the Canadian Arctic it has to be dual use um, stuff and and the way to deal with them uh, with the climate change changing the um, you know, permafrost is, 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 is melting and all that, all that stuff. You cannot really count on having a 25-year uh, plan for those uh, buildings to be there. Uh, it's hard to get them there anyway and all that, all, that, all that problem. You need to think more technological solutions uh, about um, dealing with the infrastructure uh, uh, trouble. That includes pan domain awareness, uh, includes you know, uh, undersea uh, surveillance capabilities, uh, space, uh, cyber, the whole uh, understanding of what is going on in, in, in the Arctic. And that also requires, again, communications infrastructure that needs to be operated there. That requires proper uh, energy infrastructure to be able to fuel that, um, uh, that capability. Transportation, uh, ports, you know, airships, other things uh, that one needs to 
really focus on. So infrastructure um, is going to be the essential component when it comes to uh, the Canadian Arctic, and as, as Arctic's importance really uh, uh, increases over time, we need to be able to address uh, that, and, and new technological solutions will probably be uh, one, way, uh, one way to go. That also includes, of course, uh, NORAD modernization uh, uh, on, on, on the Canadian side, and, and actually paying both attention and devoting the necessary resources to be able to uh, do the uh, NORAD modernization and, and really improve what has been last time done in 1985, I believe. The second one is um, we need to thinking we need to really think more innovatively when it comes to the institutional arrangements uh, in the Arctic. It has to be probably a, uh, a set of um, overlapping um, uh, institutional arrangements uh, that should include uh, a, a, a Arctic working group, a formal one perhaps in NATO, that includes uh, not only the Arctic. Uh, nations and hopefully soon that will include Sweden and Finland, but also those uh, countries like UK um, that have been showing interest uh, in the Arctic as well as, as, well as the Baltic uh, nations, which I'll come at, at the third point. But that cannot be the only institutional structure in which uh, allies need to take security in the Arctic um, seriously. Uh, one way to go, you know, uh, Tim talked about uh, AUKUS and, and making it extended. One way to also think about is the Arctic 7 now, with when Sweden and Finland become uh, members, uh, eight, seven of the eight Arctic Council members will be NATO. But it is also possible to think Arctic 7 as developing a, a technology and security uh, structure, which the, uh, the, the, the Arctic Council's uh, merit was not, uh, remit was not really uh, uh, security. So in, in a similar uh, structure to AUKUS or, or QUAD, one might perhaps think about an Arctic 7 uh, on, on technology and security. And, and the third uh, is perhaps rethinking about NORAD and, and perhaps having uh, our uh, you know, Danish allies uh, being integrated perhaps a little bit more uh, onto that structure. But that overlapping uh, institutional arrangements that deal with technology and security in the Arctic mm -hmm. uh, needs to be done because we can't really do it um, alone ourselves. I have about 30 seconds, so I'm just going to be very quick uh, on the last, uh, last point. That might also include, by the way, uh, rethinking the northern flank uh, in a more uh, institutionalized way um, and perhaps new, uh, new, uh, new commands that will be perhaps you know, stationed either in, in Norway or, 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 or both in Norway and Alaska or in Canada. Uh, so we need to rethink, we need to bring northern uh, flank to the same level with the eastern and the southern flank um, as we go, go forward. And, and in, in 20 uh, seconds, I think we need to think more thoroughly about the Arctic, uh, Baltic connections, that uh, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, and Finland and Sweden becoming uh, NATO members, uh, you have uh, a, a much stronger connection between two regions. And we need to uh, approach a holistic way um, to uh, the, these, these both regions as Russia is, is looking at in, in a relatively holistic way. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, you have, um, you have my admiration, all three of you for staying within time limits and behaving like good citizens. So please come again. Uh, I have two questions before we turn to the audience. The first one, very general, and the second topical. General question. Tim mentioned a critical, critical, uh, critical words, institutional knowledge, which you mentioned both with respect to China and Russia. Now, we look at um, the so-called collective West in all of its, with all of its moving parts, including NATO with its Arctic group, the United States with its low high of thinking. When it comes to knowledge and the ability to think about the Arctic in integrated terms, how do you assess this particular balance? Mm. Would you like me to answer? Please. I'll have a shot. The Arctic Council is assured of its sovereignty. And through the Illelucid Declaration some years ago, it made it clear we rule the place. China agreed. But the Arctic Council concerns now, because of environment, is sovereign rights. Environmental protection, sustainable development, underpinned by law, UNCLUS, and hard science. 
which helps the politicians come to a consensual decision. That's how the region is run. Hmm. Under pressure now, if NATO comes in, they are concerned with sovereignty, borders, boundaries, etc. Hmm. And there is a danger that the very good work of the Arctic Council, although ap appearing fairly soft, is critical because of environment protection and sustainable development. And it doesn't get involved in strategic matters. So we have Arctic Council sovereign rights mandated environmentally. We have NATO concerned only with territory and borders in terms of sovereignty. And then we have the EU quietly saying, perhaps we should introduce the Antarctic Treaty as a form of governance of the region. The beauty of the Antarctic Treaty was that it there were various countries, including my own, inevitably in, the, in those days, said that we have rights and territory in the Antarctic Treaty. The beauty of it is we suspended it along with the United States, <laughs> and we said there would be no further claims of territoriality. Think through, therefore, yes. especially what the French are doing, suggesting with the Antarctic Treaty, with the Arctic Council. And when I mentioned that if Russia moves out of the Arctic Council because it feels that it has been uh, under NATOization, and therefore what's the point of the Arctic Council? The champagne will be popping in Beijing because they go, we don't need NATO, we don't need the Arctic Council. What the Arctic is, is the heritage of all mankind. <laughs> Infrastructure, Chinese, is moving from onshore where it's been spotted for what it's been doing with railways and gas pipelines and building stations and all the rest of it. It is moving infrastructure offshore, UAVs, submarines, etc., cables, linking it to space and essentially through AI, robotics, social media and all the rest of it. It is imposing from there via Arctic offshore links, which don't impose upon your sovereignty, ladies and gentlemen, in the Arctic Council. No need to worry. We are then imposing our governance systems there. Take the heritage of mankind on Earth, then link it to the new concepts of the global commons. Deep seas, deep Earth, deep space. And that is the way they're looking at it, where there is no governance in the Arctic. That is the threat and the link between institutions and infrastructure. And the point about infrastructure, just I may add, is China is looking at infrastructure in terms of the Northern Sea Route, both for oil and gas and an entry into Europe and the platform. But the infrastructure is also the offshore infrastructure being put in place. Russia knows about this and watches it, that is linked directly to space for the cis lunar governance of the region. That is the institutional linkage within, with Be what's going on. Before I ask the topical question, any immediate comment? on my question or on what Tim has just said. Yes, Pavel, please. Just probably a very short note that about the institutional uh, tradition and memory in the Arctic, it is a very peculiar uh, arrangement that all hard military security matters were always bracketed out mm. of the mandate of the Arctic Council, the Barents Council and many other uh, um, uh, Arctic um, groups and cooperations and institutions. That was something too complicated to touch, too loaded with all sorts of controversies. And that's why the Arctic Council was able to continue working normally after the beginning of Russian aggression against Ukraine in the year 14. None of their business essentially, business as usual. And that blunder is exposed now. It is impossible to break these things out. This institutional memory, yes, and tradition, important as it is, cannot be sustained. Mm. Arctic Council is dysfunctional. Uh, we need to find new ways of cooperating and hard security matters will have to be incorporated this way or that way. Well, there's the terrain of a very interesting debate, which we're not going to have here. <laughs> uh, very quickly, the topical question. We have witnessed since 2021 uh, the rupturing of cables between Norway and the mm. Svalbard archipelago. We have witnessed in September explosions under the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Uh, we have witnessed uh, very recently um, surveillance by highly sophisticated drones of offshore Norwegian uh, energy installations. If 
this pressure, and indeed, uh, should it come about, attacks on critical infrastructure um, in the Baltic and Arctic regions um, progress, how do you see this affecting the strategy of, the, of, of key players, uh, Russia, China, and the, and, and the West? What will need to be rethought about the current Arctic policy and strategy? I suppose that is not a simple topical question, but a very big one. Anything immediate. I'm looking at you, so you might as well. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. All right. Yes, we have uh, not very long, but already convincing track record of this uh, unexplained, generally hard to attribute uh, incidents in which Russia is certainly the prime suspect. And none of them so far is of such a scale that uh, all alarm bells need to be immediately uh, rung. They think it's more about signaling than about um, inflicting real damage, particularly when the damage is inflicted on Russia's own uh, gas pipeline. Uh, but this signaling also means that we have an early warning in the collective West. We need know what to watch, we know how to uh, to, what, uh, to what to prepare. Uh, we can contemplate not only measures related to resilience, but also measures related to creating uh, uh, threats to Russia's own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not advocating about kind of cutting uh, cables leading to uh, Russian uh, naval bases. But nevertheless, Russia is not really a great cyber power. Uh, it can do some cyber hooliganism, but its own cyber systems are extremely vulnerable. And I think it might be important this way or that way to indicate that. Hmm. I think I <clears throat> when Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, one of the things that uh, was fairly disastrous for a lot of people, probably in the defense and intelligence community, is you lost strategic ambiguity. The question is to say, is not to ask whether the Americans or the Russians blew up uh, uh, Nord Stream. And the question is, whether you like it or not, strategic ambiguity is back. And yes. pipelines being cut, yes. the Russians have a capability to do that, so do the Americans. Um, cables being cut, so do the Americans, so do the Russians. So there's a, a restoration of that. Pavel's previous point is linked to this in terms of the usefulness of the Arctic Council. At all costs, keep it. Because as, as we mentioned, heard in the NATO talk just before this, we have to think of the future. And that is a damn good conduit to Russia and perhaps China. But the United States, in terms of what we're doing institutionally and in relation to this present question, they have now coordinated the Coast Guard with the DOD. And perhaps more importantly and significantly and strategically, they have coordinated the um, uh, National Aeronautical and uh, Oceanographic Agency. So you can see that those sort of agencies which are more kinetic, they can have more frank talks with Russia in time and China, I think should augment the Arctic Council and not replace it for reasons now. But America's fortunate now. It doesn't matter whether they did it or not or whether Russians, the strategic ambiguity is back. Mm -hmm. And that makes people think before they reach for their weapons. A very I, good point. That's part, and that is doubtless the intention. Let me pick up two. Okay. Online yeah, just, questions. Just, yes. Just, just add, add maybe one, uh, one quick, quick point. Just following uh, Pavel's comment, um, I think the the idea of of engaging in a in a, in a quad like or AUKUS like uh, development with with Arctic Seven uh, that includes security, uh, intelligence sharing, uh, etc., would actually prepare um, us for the for these early warning and, and get better with the critical infrastructure, which also should include offensive capabilities, given the fact that. Arctic is a lot more important for Russia and Russian development. About 25% of the GDP comes from the resources there. They have a lot more people, etc. So it, it's that they also need to be able to understand that there is this other development that can threaten them, that they have a lot more to lose compared to, uh, to others. So I think that requires, you know, 
changing the mindset of not only being on the reactive side of things, but also thinking about offensively uh, when need to be, and develop that institutional memory and, uh, and reflexes, um, which can be done in a unilateral setting uh, with like-minded allies. So. We have three online questions, all anonymous. In principle, I don't believe in answering anonymous questions, but the questions are sufficiently uh, worthy and um, serious that I think we can make an exception. <laughs> uh, I'll answer the first one, which is, who needs to be convinced of the importance of the Arctic? Well, if we have more signaling of the kind that um, Pavel referred to, my answer would be not many people would still need to be convinced. Yeah. But, the, the, but the other question, which is a fundamental question, which comes out of this opening salvos of a debate between Pavel and Tim, is if not the Arctic Council, then what? Yes. It is an open question. At the moment, we don't have an answer to that. We need to work on it. Because uh, I don't think uh, that uh, in the situation where Russia is firm set on the conclusion that it is at war with the West, that NATO is the enemy, it will be possible to, to, to resume the workings of our, our Arctic Council as we know it. It is, uh, we need to, to find new forms, new formats set on new traditions. But I am also worried about question two, yes. about Russia-China. The question is, I will read it aloud, what is the price for the West of letting Russia, China control the Arctic? I think it means Russia or China, and it might also mean Russia and China control the Arctic. I am always kind of uh, finding it confusing when in the same sentence, kind of security threats produced in the Arctic by Russia and China. Listen, it's two entirely different policies, two very different stories. Uh, Russia's militarization of the Arctic, very sustained policy, flawed as it was, was never really in tune with Chinese ambitions and interests in the Arctic. China was doing, really never doing anything in, uh, regarding militarization of the Arctic. It was always in favor of broader international cooperation in the Arctic. Militarization and nuclearization in particular never really was a part of this agenda. And presently, uh, Russia-China strategic partnership in the Arctic remains very limited. And China isn't really that particularly keen on expanding it because there is a growing convention in Beijing that Russia is a loser in this confrontation. And they don't really want to put all their eggs in the basket which is about to, uh, to burst open. China is very interested in uh, setting new format of international cooperation in the Arctic. And they think this is something we need to take seriously and not necessarily reject as a, a hostile intention. I would. Unless Tim wants to dispute that latter point, I would be inclined to, but I'm not going to do so <laughs> now. Uh, but Tim, please. In the Dongbei regions of uh, the three provinces making up the Dongbei region in northeast China, they are moving northwards towards Yakutsk, and there's a lot of other things going on. Strategic purpose get the Yakuts by rail along the riverine access into the, to the Northern Sea Route, which gets over uh, the Bering Strait choke point. The relationship there, I, I tend to agree with Pavel. This is a question of degree and not a question, I think, of absolutes. If you want to work in the Arctic as an Asian country like, like China, you have to be sponsored. And Russia, from a technical point of view, the size, the geography, the, question, the, the points I made, to some extent, Russia will sponsor China in the region, and it also gives it its license to operate. So submarines and things like that are, a dead, are, a, are an absolute red line. But what you have is a movement with, Russia, with China financing the NSR through the Belt and Road and the underpinning of the Novatech operation of moving uh, east to west. Then China is moving Dongbei up through to the Arctic to the NSR north-south. North and then we have the cis lunar opportunity. And as 85% of the, of the NSR is in genuine, unclass classified uh, territorial waters of some form or another, exclusive economic zones, then that is a launch pad there. The key thing to look at in this relationship is it starts with little projects, farming, refining, 
in the Russian Far East with the Chinese. It then moves to a technology innovation program. It then pu puts in infrastructure up to Yakutsk and, and looking towards Riverine Passage up to Tixi. And then they discuss ballistic mo mo um, missile early warning systems. Yes. And then they fund Novatech. Mm. What you're seeing is each of these operations are in and of themselves confidence building measures where they're testing each other's relationship and they're getting strategic. So the very last thing, which some of you may have heard about, it's public knowledge now, talking to Russians, Chinese approaching them and asking if they can put cruise missiles inside Russian territorial or EEZ waters in the Bering Straits for second strike capability. Yes. You do not allow ships, not that the Russians have agreed to it, but if you're building, offering to build ballistic missile early warning systems, you're giving access to a new slot and you are considering that sort of question. Sea line that communications. Is, my view in the, in the Arctic is we're moving from a land-based geoeconomic relationship between the two of them, bearing in mind Pavel's reservations, which are correct. They are, they are being reduced by confidence building measures, and we're moving from a geoeconomic land-based relationship, partnership in the Arctic to a non-territorial strategic alliance. And it has very little to, to some extent to do with the Arctic. It is about space. So I think that incrementally there are some basic things. I just repeat last time. If you want to operate in the Arctic and in that part of the Arctic, you must get Russian permission. Um, 9596 nine, type submarines are going to cause a problem. And it is a point, though, the good side is if that is true and all the stuff I'm saying, then this is fantastic leverage points in terms of driving a wedge in the Sino-Russian relationship. But it is moving, generally, land-based partnership, geoeconomic, CIS-based, over the Arctic, geostrategic alliance, and it's about go the governance aspect. But as Pavel says, there's a lot of reservations about that, whether it'll happen. But this, very, the very, direction is pretty clear. Very challenging thought. I, um, I take the relative absence of hand, raised hands in the hall I don't know whether it means fasc <laughs> general fascination or bafflement, but Bobo, I saw your hand very early, so please. And I've seen the two behind you as well. Um, Tim, you make a, a very persuasive case for the Arctic being a, a source of converging Chinese and Russian interests. And yet, when you balance it out, I'm, I'm really struck here by the imbalance mm. of benefits here. That China gets 70 years of institutionalized knowledge on STEM, space, the Arctic. And what does Russia get? Russia gets the square root of Sodor. It, it, you know, intermediary between EU and China, it never was. And it certainly won't be now. Shared Eurasian space, I would say there's a real changing of the guard in Eurasia. So I wonder whether this imbalance of interests will make it the Arctic not a source of convergence, but increasingly a source of tension and divergence. And I'm really struck when you mention the global commons, the Chinese focus on global commons, no matter how Beijing packages it, it's still about a vision of the global commons versus Russia's vision of hyper-sovereignty. Yes. And it strikes me that even if the tensions don't happen straight away, it won't be that long, say the medium term, say 10 years, maybe even earlier, given the pace of the Arctic melt that those tensions will start to become more pronounced and less maskable. Thank you. Quick response, because now interest is building up. No. Mm -hmm. you have, you're right. If you have a quick response. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm, I'm That's a brilliant response. Facetious. <laughs> there, there is tension there. Um, the Russian benefit is they know whether they're up against it. They're making a lot of money on the STEM transference. Um, and what they're banking on, as I said, global GDP and therefore superpower status in the 21st century is the service sector. That's underpinned by technology. And their only bet when I talk to them, quite frankly, is they hang on and they hope they get some benefits when China, they hope, wins the battle of the United States over technology, gets the service sector, and they think it's, 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 it's pretty marginal about that. But on the other hand, I think we misunderstand or misinterpret or underestimate 
just how much this is a bit of a petri dish for the two of them to begin to look at regionalization instead of globalization, virtual technology to get around the problem of containment and the development of a, of a multi-regional world on the route to a multipolar world, which they will not announce first because that's an existential threat to the United States and they'll hit them. So you do a multi-regional world, 3D technology, the, the, the changes in the IP and shortening global value chains. And that part of the world is, you're quite right, in a way that the virtue of it is, who knows the Arctic? Just let them get on with it. But the Pacific Arctic is forming up as a region Tim, on the back of oil and gas. Must stop you. The lady behind Bobo in red, please. Thank you. Hello. My name is Lolita Sigana. I am an international consultant based here in uh, Riga. And uh, my question actually somewhat follows Bobo Lowe's question um, about the general feeling that uh, Russia might be experiencing about China's influence that is definitely uh, should be ambiguous. And in this respect, uh, given that Arctic Council has always been a place where before Ukraine war, Russia uh, behaved rather pragmatically. Uh, has anyone heard any informal signals from Russia where it has been signaled that there is discontent with the present state of affairs? Well, I think that's your discontent, I think, is definitely there uh, because there were great hopes for Russian chairmanship in the Arctic Council. There were kind of a very ambitious plan and there was a funding behind this plan. And now it's all, uh, it's all wasted. It's all a one, a one big fiasco. But as far as cooperation specifically with China in the Arctic is concerned, Yes, I think that Russian obsession with sovereignty, with declaring that Northern Sea Route is ours, that we want to expand our territorial shelf, even if it doesn't contain anything of value, just because it uh, answers this uh, idea of owning, uh, owning the Arctic. I think the clash there with the Chinese um, Arctic policy is uh, very strongly built in. And I think in the course of the eight months of this war, the hidden uh, tension between Russia and China uh, have uh, greatly intensified. Russia is disappointed about the level of Chinese support, which is much more verbal than material. China is disappointed in the whole enterprise of Russia going into, into that war and losing it. So I don't really think we are set to see in the near future any uh, expansion of Russia-China uh, partnership in the Arctic. I think China would be looking for other partners in the Arctic. And uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's a wise policy to push uh, China out uh, of that region. May I just add one 30 no? second um, point to this? And I think one thing to watch out for, and I agree with, with Pavel that, that uh, for Russians, it's like we'll be selling the family silver. Um, to, to go for the, uh, for the Arctic and basically turn it over Chinese. But one thing to watch out for, I would say, is to see whether they are interested in uh, conducting military exercises in the Arctic. They did everywhere else, in the Pacific, in the Black Sea, in the, in the Mediterranean, right? Uh, but not the Arctic. So I think that's like the last um, uh, right. man remaining, right? So if that starts changing, then we can think about maybe whether Russia is uh, changing its policy because it is in such a dire strait. But I think uh, until it gets there, I don't think, you know, uh, well, we will see that. This, Ru this year, Russia is compelled really to really very seriously reduce the scope of its exercises yeah. in the Arctic. And the Northern Fleet usually goes in the long cruise along the Northern Sea Route mm -hmm. in September. It was very symbolic this mm -hmm. year. And we had no usual strategic mm -hmm. exercises, which typically happen September, October. There were exercises in February, just before the invasion, but nothing uh, uh, this autumn. So I think that uh, Russian military are too busy with other tasks. Exercising is not, really, is not really a priority. I think um, it, 
the weather vane, look at Novatech. China's investment there is not just economic and oil and gas, it's Belt and Road, it's Northern Sea Route, mm. it's sea power. Mm. In terms of, again, I mentioned that changing a view of this and having a more dynamic view in 3D, we're looking very much at Bastion and, and the west side of here. I'm talking about the Eurasian Arctic. Two weeks ago, I think the US Coast Guard picked up a Chinese destroyer in the Bering Straits, surrounded by five or six uh, uh, Russian destroyer sh ships of some sort or, or other. The plan is most definitely seeing the connection between the NSR and the Western Pacific in terms of its Malacca di dilemma. So I would say that that aspect is still going on. But the key about this, as I say, is follow Novatech like a hawk. If they pull from that, that's a really major strategic problem, both for Putin and for um, Russia, because um, there was economic leverage um, uh, afforded by that over South Korea, Japan, and China, if Russia could have achieved that along with the power of Siberia in terms of manufacturing ability, which is what the US was very keen to, ha to have and lost it with Exxon when in the first round of sanctions. There was no then America along the NSR designing it, putting the search and rescue ports of safe haven in, and then getting to that Northeast Asian market. There are no economic tools for the United States along that Northern Sea Route. So again, I agree with Powell uh, to a large extent, but, but I wouldn't write it off. And this Northern Sea Route aspect out in the Pacific Arctic with this Dongbei region, the things that are going on there behind the, the more that Russia is in a sense, de facto covering the hinterland of China in those sort of regions, the more you see the aggression c coastally in the East China Sea. So there's an element there that they help each other. That's part of the reason why they're so more aggressive at sea is because their back door, the hinterland, is now partially, not covered in a physical sense, but in terms of the thinking there, putting in infrastructure, Primora, Dongbei, Yakuts, and other things that are going on there, PS, uh, para Siberia. So um, I don't think it's that black and white, but Pavel's points are valid, but look for Novatech. The, there's a lady, another lady behind. I see two up here, and also Alan Riley, I think. Were you? No, you weren't. Oh, right. Well, there's a lady on the aisle, and then there's a gentleman here. So we have the lady on the aisle first, please. Thank you very much. My name is Amelie Teusen. I'm senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Uh -huh. My question um, is related a little bit to the title of the panel, and I would like to hear a little bit more about the connections between the Arctic and the Baltic Sea as areas of operation, as areas of strategic thinking, now that Finland and Sweden are hopefully soon members of NATO as well. Thank you. Taking um, I think I still we can take big, if, a Why don't we just take w two more questions from back here first? Because now the, the clock is really running down. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I guess we can give the, give the mic for two of us. Can you stand uh, up, please? Yeah. Do you mind? And introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm uh, yet a Latvia member and also international secretary of uh, the use wing of political party unity. Um, my question is regarding Greenland. Uh, as you know, China is uh, China attempted many times to uh, build infrastructure in Greenland, and China also uh, try as, as hard as possible to get to uh, mining access in in, in Greenland. And um, Americans see that, Americans are worried about Chinese presence in, in Greenland. And that's why uh, ex-president of US even uh, suggested to buy Greenland from Denmark. Uh, and taking all of that into account, as well as the fact that Greenland is not uh, part of the EU and there are some discussions about independence from Denmark. Uh, the, the question is how much the EU is present in uh, Greenland, how much EU shares American worries, and yeah, are we willing to engage in that fight for right. uh, 
Thank geopolitical you. fight, yeah. And there are Canadian interests here as well. Can we just have one yeah. final question up here? Uh, hello, my name is Vestros Berzinc. I represent Yata Latvia. And I wanted to ask a question about the Northern Sea Route, as everyone here basically. So we all talk about uh, China and Russia all the time when talking about Northern Sea Route, but we keep forgetting that there are seven uh, Western uh, Arctic Council member states. So I just wanted to ask, so what should these seven other uh, seven Arctic Council uh, states do to ensure that their benefits are maximized without helping uh, China and Russia too much when we're talking about the Northern Sea Route? Thank you. Balkan, do you want to start off on this? Sure. Um, uh, maybe I can just uh, touch upon the, the first two, two questions very quickly. The second one, um, I mean, we, we have Danish colleagues here who can talk more on, on the Greenland, but uh, if you're interested, work by a, 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 a former colleague, um, Kamida Sorensen at the Royal Danish Defense College, who is a, who's a China expert, but also has been doing quite a lot of work on the Arctic and, and Chinese uh, role and intentions in the Arctic. Might be a good place, uh, might be a good place to look. The, uh, on the issue of, I think, the, the, the Arctic-Baltic connection, I think that's, like, like I pointed out, I think that's something we need to uh, engage in multi-level sort of overlapping institutional uh, uh, thinking and how uh, operationally we need to think both in the, in the Arctic and the Baltic, what are the connections you have, you know, Denmark sitting right in the middle, and, you know, <laughs> controlling the, uh, the, the straits to Baltic, but also with Greenland and a major uh, Arctic power. Uh, Canada here uh, having significant uh, uh, security commitments uh, as well as a major Arctic power, Finland, Sweden. So we are actually Norway. So we are talking about, uh, uh, we need to think more about how to operate in both, both of these theaters and as, as Russians move their sort of um, uh, uh, forces, how we need to think about that. I think that requires uh, institutional uh, memory building, that requires structure building, and that requires coordination uh, in a much, uh, much deeper uh, level. And that's why I was making the case that we need to have a much more formal understanding and a, and a working group and, and perhaps regional comments uh, in NATO, as well as developing a, 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 you know, Arctic 7 kind of structure when it focuses on, on technology, security, intelligence sharing, etc. With just less than three minutes remaining, including 20 seconds from me, your final comments, please. Okay, I will try to combine um, the two answers in one minute. On the reconfiguration of the Arctic Balt uh, Baltic geostrategic space, one point I want to make, it come as a complete surprise to Russia, which really was working on separating them. And that's why the Northern Fleet Command was granted the status of separate military district and separate strategic command. And Russia was really thinking that's the Arctic area, that's the Baltic separate area with, with different command. And now suddenly they are in fact reunited, which Russia still needs to kind of reconceptualize. On the Northern Sea Route, well, the economic viability of this route is still a big question mark. Uh, a lot of investment is needed in the infrastructure, and Russia was investing primarily in its kind of military uh, defense. Uh, so even for China, uh, the, uh, not to mention Japan, the idea of Northern Sea Route as a kind of transit corridor uh, has really moved away uh, into mid-term future and uh, m many mid-term horizons are now really beyond a uh, vision covered by too uh, thick fog of this war. Jim. Baltic states, um, sea power and the sea warfare will be, uh, will be uh, real pressure now. And so the advent of um, of Sweden and Finland there greatly assist that in terms of US carrier group security from the north. Um, so that they'll be very much involved in that. The requirement for Russia to get S-400 in very fast as it takes on the United States on that sea battle now is going to be enhanced with Sweden and Finland on board. And therefore the air power that the US will subsequently bring in after winning the maritime battle along Kaliningrad and this part of the world um, will be solved. The complication again is China suggesting they build a rail from Finland under the um, Bay of Bothy, uh, uh, Gulf of Finland into this state and onward is the geoeconomic aspect. So um, buckle up.
Mm. Um, but it's Sweden and Finland there from the north is greatly going to help the United States and NATO in terms of the air power and the maritime battle that would ensue should, it, should the worst happen. Greenland, China wants to be there for the same reasons that the United States is already there, uh, certainly from the, the base in Tula and the, again, the uplink and downlink to Cisluna. Um, China, if I were them, one of the things they can play around with and, and look at is they, they encourage the uh, indigenous people of Greenland to go independent because then what they do in terms of disruption is they have the first indigenous people on earth who are running a, a sovereign government. And then the Maoris in Australia say, uh, in New Zealand say, well, what about us? And then the Aborigines in Australia say, well, what about our rights? And then even in the United States. So they begin to, dis to sow discord. In terms of the last question about um, what do the Arctic Council do? In the very broadest sense, I would say educative. Teach NATO about the Arctic. Uh, look after the Arctic Council because when this is all over you're going to need a conduit to Russia and possibly China um, so educative sensible uh, not knee-jerk and emotional think about what Russia is going to do at or not in it or out of it so mainly educative um, and itself learning about NATO and the limits of both organizations, but both the Arctic Council's institution and NATO's institution in this new world, region of the world where most people know nothing about it. So it's quite a dangerous area for policymakers and politicians that are not that familiar with it outside of this immediate audience, but many in NATO are not aware of it. No. Um, thank you all.